Hello everyone, my name is Gerard Dragon Rider Khalil, but most of you at home know me as the Completionist right here on YouTube. And welcome back to part 4 of Final Fantasy 7 Month. Now we are nearing the end of our in-depth look at the main game. Today, we will spend a good amount of time focusing on the Completionist aspects of this game, including the Master Materia, Top Tier Weapons, Limit Breaks, and other side quests such as fighting the big weapons. Our guests join us one last time to help us wrap up the plot of Final Fantasy 7. So, without further ado, let's dive into Disc 3. Last week we saw Sephiroth's biological father, the mad scientist Hojo, use the cannon to blow open the path to Sephiroth's final resting place, the Northern Crater. All that's left is the final showdown- wait! Why are we doing an entire episode if all we gotta do is go fight Sephiroth? Easy! One word, closure. Closure for the characters, closure for us as gamers, and closure is the last thing you need on the journey through loss, and discovering who you really are. Disc 3 is the closure disc, and as the completionist, I have my own special closure I need from this game as well. So, let's put the creator on hold for just a second and delve into some side quests. You know, Final Fantasy 7, like that was the defining RPG of 1997. That was the defining RPG of probably that decade. You know, of, of the 90s, that's that's saying a lot, so maybe I shouldn't say that. But, it, like, it, one of them, by far, in, in terms of storytelling, in terms of gameplay, in terms of telling this, this epic... I mean, quite literally, it was an epic. It wasn't just a video game. It was, it was this, this piece of art, you know, that aspired to so much more than the sum of its parts. I guess that's true, right? Like, games now, like, it feels like, you know, there's a lot more effort going into it, but... On a, in a different way, like it's all about production as opposed to like this world building shit, right? Like I don't feel like there are games that are as robust as those old RPGs were, where like there's all kinds of shit happening. Like the only games I can think of that compare to that kind of feeling are like Fallout or Skyrim. It was definitely a fun conclusion, but I think that there's a lot of things that when you beat the game, if you didn't do all the side quests, you didn't go back and experience everything that the game had to offer, like if you didn't do all Vincent's storyline, you missed a lot that was in the game, and the thing is, you didn't need it in order to complete the game and complete the story, because really, it feels like, even though you have a giant cast of characters, it feels like after Aerith's death, it really is, at least cinematic-wise, just about Tifa and Cloud, and that's what they focus on the entire last part of the game. For me, that was just like... I would pick up the game and I'd be like, you know, I'm tired of doing the storyline, what can I do today? Oh, let's, you know, let's go bleed some chocobos, or let's race some chocobos, or let's go to this place, and, or, or, you know, we'll go to the Gold Sorcerer and take part in the, the fighting arena. You know, there was just so much on offer besides the storyline, and the storyline itself was just immense. So the fact that they, they offered you that much extra was, was a real good, real good thing for me. Part of the reason Final Fantasy VII is so wonderful is that it fleshes out the world of Gaia with plenty of extra stuff to try that has nothing to do with the main plot. More specifically, we have the Golden Saucer, the weapon fights, all the weapons and final limit breaks, breeding the Gold Chocobo, and the Master Materias. Wowee, we got a lot to cover, but we're only going to cover Cloud's limit break, ultimate weapon, and a few of the Materia. In the interest of time for this portion, we want to show you all that we think is relevant to our overarching theme, so let's start off with a little closure for Yuffie and Vincent. Back in Disc 1, when she stole the party's materia, we learned that Yuffie has an identity crisis of her own. Yuffie's family rules Wutai Village, and after the Wutai Shinra War, even though a reactor was never built, Yuffie's father, Goto, gave in to Shinra, 
and Wu Tai was reduced to a tourist attraction, a shell of its former glory. It leaves Yuffie feeling torn. Wu Tai's loss of spirit makes her feel ashamed, like her people are cowards. Yuffie doesn't know whether she should do what she thinks is right and fight Shinra tooth and nail, or follow the complacent path of her people. Loss and identity in its own special way, all rolled into one. Upon a return visit to Wu Tai, Yuffie is able to take on the trial in the pagoda in the back of the village. You fight just as Yuffie through four bosses until you reach the top, where you discover your last opponent is none other than Godo. The fight is brutal, and in the end, both Yuffie and her father are left exhausted on the floor. It leaves them feeling a sense of mutual respect, and afterwards, Godo explains that fighting just to show they're still mighty makes the Wutai clan no better than the Shinra. What's really good for the village is finding the balance between strength and determination, and that will put a stop to the constant fighting. It brings Yuffie's arc to a close, and you also get the Leviathan Materia and Yuffie's Final Limit Break all creation. So, it all works out, closure found. Now, on to Vincent. Once you get the submarine in the cave where you found the Key of the Ancients, you can keep exploring along the western wall until you find a passage leading outside to another chamber behind a waterfall. If you have Vincent in your party, an event will trigger once you're inside. Vincent recognizes a voice he hears in the cave as belonging to his lost love, Lucrezia. Vincent and Lucrezia are forced to face their past and confront the fact that she is Sephiroth's mother. She spends all of her time in the cave, agonizing over the rumors of his death and being conflicted over whether or not giving him a mother's love would have changed anything. Lucrezia asks Vincent if the rumors of his death are true, and instead of telling her that her son might be responsible for, I don't know, the end of the world, Vincent tells her Sephiroth died. Now at peace, Lucrezia's Genova ridded spirit disappears. Giving Lucrezia closure gives Vincent closure and helps him starting his own healing process. Now we'll find out more about this in a few weeks with the Dirge of Cerberus, but for now, enjoy Vincent's ultimate weapon and his final limit break. When it comes to limit breaks, you can simply obtain them all by doing a few specific quests, but as we said earlier, we're only going to discuss one limit break in depth, and that is Cloud's Omni Slash. In order to get it, you need to survive several battles in the Golden Saucers Battle Arena. Also, important to know, you cannot teach people their final limit break until they've learned the rest. Cloud's Limit Break Omni Slash shows the exact desperation of when one man comes to a certain point, when he must fight back with everything he's got. So just for you guys, here's Omni Slash in its beautiful execution. On the surface, chocobo breeding is simple to understand. Take two chocobos, give them the right nut or greens, and get a better one. Fight battles until that one matures, and then breed that with another one. Give them the right item, and so on and so forth, until you finally get the gold chocobo. However, once you really try to do it, you'll find that it goes much, much deeper than this. You also have to get them up to a proper class by racing them at the golden saucer. Only chocobos with an S ranking will allow you to breed super efficiently, and the only way to rank up your chocobos is by winning races. On top of that, the only way to win races is by feeding your chocobos to boost their stats. So there's a lot to do here, but in the end, if you stay determined and use a good strategy, the golden chocobo will be yours in no time. Now there's different colored chocobos that do different things. The green chocobo can travel to different terrain, including mountains. The blue one can only do shallow waters. The black chocobo can do a combination of both, but the gold chocobo can go anywhere on the map, even places the high wind cannot land. Once you get your golden chocobo, you can go anywhere in the game, and if you're like us, your first stop is almost certainly going to be Round Island, a tiny little area in the northeastern corner of the map where you get the game's most powerful and notoriously long-winded summon, Knights of the Round. This summon is the most iconic and most difficult to get, and when you cast it, be prepared to wait up to a minute while all the Knights of the Round table do their thing. Almost all of the summon materia is a mandatory get for the story, but there are a few you can miss. None of them are permanently missable, which is nice, but you also have to do some side questing and revisiting to get them all. Getting them all isn't important for anything specific in terms of bonuses, but all of them will be important in order to get Master Materia sets. Wait, Master Materia? Yeah, 
The huge materia that we collected in Disc 2 and hand over to Bugenhagen now acts as a materia condenser. It will assimilate all of one type of materia into a master version. So for example, if you have all of one green set of magic materia mastered, it gets turned into one green master magic materia getting them granted the ability to use every move associated with that colored materia. So if you want to give everyone a set of master materia, you have to master all of the materia again for each character? That's nuts! Pretty much, except for the set you get from the guy in Calm. Watch guy in Calm. He's in the rightmost house and he trades you for the stuff relating to the leftover set or weapons you haven't defeated as a part of the story. There are several hard optional bosses added to the American release of the game and they grant some pretty remarkable rewards. Let's go after the Emerald Weapon first. If you fight the Emerald Weapon, you'll notice that a timer appears on screen. You need to get the underwater materia, which removes the time limit by turning an enemy into the key item, the guidebook, and give it to that same traveler in calm. It's a rough battle, and upon beating the emerald weapon, you'll get the earth harp, which you can then trade to get an extra set of master materia. Up next, we've got the ultimate weapon. The ultimate weapon is the dragon type weapon that destroyed Medeal during the whole Cloud Tifa crisis, and I think it's about time we got revenge, shall we? The weird thing about the weapon is that you can chase it in the high wind, defeat it, and then follow it to a new section and fight it again. Eventually, we defeat the weapon at Cosmo Canyon, and we are awarded Cloud's best weapon in the game, the ultimate weapon. Quick side note, when the weapon explodes, it leaves a huge crevice in the floor, allowing you to have access to the ancient forgotten forest. This side quest is weird, and you must trek through several different parts with animals and insects to get across. The ultimate payout is Cloud's Apocalypse weapon, which triples AP growth. Also, Apocalypse is a reoccurring sword in almost all Final Fantasy games. After that, it's time for the Ruby weapon. Wait! Ruby weapon? Emerald weapon? Where's the sapphire weapon? Is this Pokemon? Where am I? Come on. I'll be here all night. Not exactly, Greg. The ruby weapon by far is the hardest fight in the game, and incidentally, the strategy required to beat him just so happens to tie perfectly into the theme we've been talking about this entire time, overcoming loss. The weapon is only vulnerable when one of your characters is alive, and it has the ability to remove party members from the battle. Plus, it's constantly doing this confusing you and making it hard for you to function normally. Using the mechanics of the game, it forces you to move past loss and all the bad stuff it brings with it in order to win, and it's only through using the Hades summon, i.e. Mastery of Death, that you're able to slow him down at all. Once you do that, it's time for W Summon Knights of the Round and Mimic Chain until you're done. It's a great fight, and when you win, you get the Desert Rose, which is good to trade for an extra golden chocobo. It's subpar to the one you got from breeding, but whatever, that's the weapons. It's time to discuss the missing piece. We've talked about what the game means and how to play the game, but now let's take a look at what it feels like to play it. It was a pretty big part of my childhood. Like I was a part of like web rings and, and like um, Emily Gregg was like a big influence on me. She was like a huge Final Fantasy VII fan artist and she did like comics and stuff. And I'd like print out her comics and like bring them to school and read them and I would like try to emulate her style. And it was like because I was into Final Fantasy VII. I'm what you would call a Final Fantasy nerd. So I had played Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy V, uh, Final Fantasy, I think it was four, which was two at the time. And I got a bootleg version of five. That's how hardcore I was because I don't know if people are aware of this. When I was a wee lad, Three was six, four was two, five didn't exist, and one, I, I don't remember what one was. I maybe it was one originally, I don't remember. And so, I, I, was, I was so into them that I, I went and got all the different ones that were around. I was a big RPG nerd, and seven was just, look how beautiful it looks! I need, I need this next gen console. And there's a lot of nostalgia with Final Fantasy VII. You, you grew up on this game, and when you're 12 and you're impressionable, this game, like, it helps mold you. You become that attached to it and the storyline is great. And it's like any good storyline you see as a kid, you would remember. And a lot of people that are saying this is overrated are looking back in time from the point now where like this game changed like JRPGs and changed a lot of games and a lot of today's games are based on some of these changes. So they're used to the changes. So to them, this is nothing special, this game is overhyped. But to, to people who were there and who played it, it was 
it was game changing. It was the one. It was great. One of my favorite parts about it is the fact that like it, it was able to balance all that seriousness that we've been talking about with moments of levity and comedy and character building and you know um, relationships. And it, and it goes back to the relationships. And that's my other favorite part actually is is the dating scene. Um, you know, and whether you're going on it with, with Barrett, Tiffa, or Aerith, you know, like the fact that you could, depending on your actions, you could end up with any of those three and each one resulted in like a really interesting, deep character moment. Um, that was either funny, like the Barrett thing's hilarious, right? Here's the two guys hanging out in the tram together watching the fireworks and it's like, it's, it's, it's fantastic, it's comedy gold because it's, you know, these two bros just hanging out. Um, you know, then you have Tiffa, this like lifelong friendship and kind of this like will they won't they thing going on, which is great. And then Aerith as as kind of like the the go to kind of heartthrob, the the sob story, this this poor girl forming that relationship, um, and the fact that each of those encounters was so incredibly different and so incredibly rewarding for their in its own way, really speaks to the the strength of the relationship building in that script. When people describe what it's like to play Final Fantasy VII, it's commonly done with rose-colored glasses. Or perhaps more accurately, they're merely describing what it was like to play Final Fantasy VII. 17 years on, the game is really starting to show its age, and while I wouldn't even be close to the first person to say it, while largely excellent, the experience has never been perfect. Archaic gameplay elements and technological shortcomings are abound in Final Fantasy VII. While we'll take some time to mention them here, we'd also like to explain that we are reasonable people, and we do realize that when reviewing a 17-year-old game, there's a huge amount of hindsight, which didn't exist back then, that colors our opinion of the game now. On the flip side, it is currently 2014, and ignoring the past 17 years of gaming when formulating our review seems a little silly. So let's just get right down to it. Certain elements of gameplay, specifically those tied to progression, are severely flawed. It is very common for this game to demand obscene amounts of time out of you for combat options that are necessary to fully completing the game, or optional and usually very meager rewards. For example, mastering a set of materia for everyone takes far too long. Doing it once is fine, and getting the extra set from the emerald weapon is acceptable, but the amount of time it takes to reach the point where it's even conceivable that you might defeat the weapons is outrageous. The ruby weapon alone is worse than every other enemy in the game put together. It took me 77 hours to legitimately level up all the characters to 99 with three full sets of master materia, counting the set I got from the emerald weapon. I can't even imagine doing that six more times. It would unquestionably stop being fun. And did you know that if you hit level 99, the game doubles in difficulty in the last battle? What better way to reward you for your hard work than making it feel like it doesn't matter? I know the intent was there, but the execution was untested, and even though they fixed this to some extent in later games, it does not change the fact that it didn't work here. Another rough patch was the enemy skill materia. There are 24 skills to get from enemies, two of which are permanently missable, and six of which require the manipulation materia. Nowhere in the game does it give you any indication of how to get these skills, and it would be almost impossible to get every single one without a guide. Also, as revolutionary as the graphics were at the time, the graphics in Final Fantasy VII really do not hold up well especially the blocky ones used for the overworld. I realized that it was a weird transitional holdover from the cute chibi style sprites of the SNES days, but it was a step that could have easily been skipped and later was in Final Fantasies 8 VIII and 9 on the same console. The biggest situation Final Fantasy VII has going against it is that for newcomers to the RPG genre, the story can come off as convoluted. However, that being said, the avid Final Fantasy fan or even someone who just enjoys cinematic storytelling will continue to be invested in the story and the characters the entire length of the game. I love this game from the bottom of my heart, and my pure interest in the game made me understand it so well. But I can understand that some people would have a real hard time really enjoying the material. At the end of the day, for me, a game needs to have flaws to appropriately appreciate everything else with it. A perfect game can sometimes be a bit too boring, which is why I do not believe in a ranking system from 1 to 10. That being said, it all boils down to a matter of taste. Anyways, let's get back on track. 
For now, we have our version of the story to get through, and the final chapter is just about to begin. Yes, I did beat it, and I, I think there are a lot of emotions going up to the ending, right? Um, one was, sweet, I finally get to fight Sephiroth, like, this is, this is epic. Then it was, wow, he turned into this angel thing? Like, wow, that's, that's weird. <laughs> like, it was, it was cool, don't get me wrong, but it was like, did not see that one coming. Um, and then there was always, for me, you know, I'm, I'm the theorist guy, I like yeah, realism, I'm always like looking at realism. And so I see him do his, uh, what, meteor, right, is, is, is the final summon, and it's like this 15 minute long, like, epic animation of this rock just hurtling through space, destroying every planet. You know, he uses it multiple times during the battle, and so I'm like, eh, I don't know about this one. And you're like, oh, clearly I can survive that. So I always got a kick out of that, like, just personally. So I, I did beat Final Fantasy VII, um, and I... I don't know. I, I guess I didn't really... It was more like I triumphed over the game. I don't know, the story wasn't like... It was like, oh, life stream and stuff. It was very... Use the word a lot, but it definitely encompasses Final Fantasy VII. It was like super esoteric. It was like, oh, return to the life stream, and now it's, and it deflected Meteor, and like, was it all for naught? Was the life stream just gonna save the day anyway? And I vividly remember the final battle. I think that that's something everyone remembers. The first time you're playing a game, and all of a sudden, like a choir comes in, you're like, what is even happening right now? And there's an ability where like the world explodes. That's one of his uh, moves. It was insane. It was a lot of fun. I did beat Seven, and what happens is you kind of, you get to the end of the game, and you feel like you have to wrap everything up, and you kind of put the crater on hold. And I think this is what a lot of people did, and you go around, and you finish everything, and then you get into the crater, and it is crazy, like balls to the walls crazy. And you're like, I forgot. I forgot that this is what this game is like. And it was, for me, it was that feeling. And then like the final showdown, between Cloud and Sephiroth, it was just so fitting. It was really good. Even the showdown with Genova, like it, it's, it just resolves everything perfectly in the end. Suddenly, all that's left of our story lies in the northern crater. Emotions are high, and as the final three party members are chosen to head down to the ultimate confrontation, all bravado is lost. There's nothing anyone can say that will feel more important compared to what lies ahead. However, before they fight Sephiroth, there's the matter of Genova who finally shows its true form as it attacks the party at the top of the crater. Funnily enough, after all that time it spent posing as Sephiroth, fighting it this last time is much less exciting. Either way, with Genova gone for good, everyone meets up once again at the bottom of the crater, where they finally, for the first time in the game, see Sephiroth for what he truly is. His real power is staggering, and indeed, everyone begins to feel that the fight is already over before it's even begun. But suddenly, the power of Holy makes itself known, and Aerith's prayer gives everyone that last little boost of encouragement they need to press on. Ultimately, the loss of Aerith and the party's ability to move past it is what gives them the strength to fight a seemingly undefeatable evil. Before the final battle, everyone resolves to fight together, and once the fight starts, there's no turning back. Boy, for a group of lonely, messed up head cases, they sure did find a lot of strength in the power of friendship. One winged angel blares from your television speakers. The fight is hard and complicated. Hell, Sephiroth has his own version of Knights of the Round, where we have to watch an abridged version of the meteor destroying our solar system and eventually hurt us really badly. But, after many limit breaks, and Knights of the Round, and two separate Bizarro and Safer forms, Sephiroth is finally defeated. Your role as a player is over, but the story still needs some closure. It's time for the final showdown between Cloud and Sephiroth, one on one. No magic, no special powers, just man to man battling. It all boils down to this like super quiet moment at the end where there is no party. It's just you and, and this monster that has just like tormented you the entire game. And you get to use the most powerful, insane attack ever in Omni Slash and you just go to town on this guy. I mean, it has to be, right? Because you, 
This game starts off giving you the impression that this is a guy that is untouchable, he is above everything, he is way above cloud. And then you, the final chapter of this game is showing the growth, like now Cloud knows who he is and he knows what he has to do and he's here and he's in front of this guy who was untouchable but suddenly he's not untouchable. It's, it's this immensely cathartic moment, right, because at that point, you hate this this guy so much, and you just want to see him. And and here I am thinking like, oh man, I don't, I don't have any healing powers. Like, what am I going to do to fight this guy? But then it's like, oh, he's on me slash great. But it was it was awesome because that was the first I didn't earn that uh, limit break in the game, so that was my first time seeing it. And it was like, whoa, look at this, look at this power that I have. And when he's finally gone, all that's left is good. Cloud smiles as he gets to see Aerith one last time before he's yanked back to reality by Tifa as the crater collapses around him. The party escapes the crater, but they're not out of the woods yet. Meteor is still coming, and it doesn't look like Holy is going to be enough to stop it. Things seem hopeless. Holy was summoned too late, and now its power is only adding to the destruction. But then, up from underneath the planet itself, comes the tendrils of the life stream. Aerith's power combines with that of the planet to save everyone. The path to rebirth is through death, and our themes of loss and identity wrap up around themselves for this ambiguous and yet somehow fitting end. As the credits roll, we can sit back and reflect on the journey we just endured. But before we go, we see Red 13 with two younglings, many years later, showing us what has happened to the planet. Midgar is filled with plant life and covered in green. We know deep down inside that the planet will be reborn. Like in modern games, they try to like perfectly emulate what the the artist had, and then it doesn't work out right because it's a game. But Final Fantasy VII wasn't really about the game aspect of it. It was kind of about like the world aspect of it, and and that felt really cool. And it kind of changed my perspective on like what a game could be, which is weird because. After I had played it and finished it, and there was like this big like, oh, Final Fantasy VII is one of the best games ever. I had like this like hipstery kind of like, oh, well, no, it's not, because it's all bad, and there's all these problems, and and blah blah blah. And there was like this time in my life where I like really hated on Final Fantasy VII, and I think for a while I actually believed it. But like, it was, it did like affect me as a kid. It was like a pretty big deal growing up to me. It's a very very serious game that has moments of joy, and you're like, I can see that they enjoyed making this. It's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I mean, my impression of what happened was the reactors that were sucking out the live stream, obviously this left, like, Midgar was almost just a drainage pipe, right, a drain, and there was all these holes because they were draining out the live stream, and it was just the easiest place for the live stream to come up out of and get rid of all of that bad, all of that so it was, I think it was a cleansing in a way. It was a live stream cleansing what was like this pollute, awful city that was at the center of everything bad. I feel, I feel like you need, I, it, it's time for me to probably go back and revisit it just based off of this interview and, and talking about it and revisiting those moments and refreshing those memories because I think I would get a lot more out of it and a lot of different things out of it at this point. It's interesting how artwork can really change based on where you are in life. Uh, certain themes will speak to you more than others. Certain moments will stand out to you more than others. You know, I played the game early on, and so like the more comedic bits really stood out to me. Now I'm older and in a very different place in my life, so probably some of the more mature themes would really resonate with me at this point. There's the characters have experienced loss, and they are like for better or worse damaged goods, and then. 
you, the player, by the end of disc one, you're a damaged player going into disc two because you've lost a key party member. None of the other characters, if you're like me, you played with her most of the time. In, in your first group, you, you had your flower girl doing pretty much all the healing and doing all the work. And then that's you, the player, but the game itself is a, a, a damaged, flawed game because of all the things. And I think that's what's great about Final Fantasy VII and great about video games especially like the artful ones, is like any good pieces of art, they speak to you differently. And, and they're constantly changing and they're constantly getting you to experience them in new ways. And it's, I'm not a type of person to really go back and play a game again because for me, it, it, it's the completionist attitude, right? It's like, I did it, I did it, I did it, I checked, I checked it off my list. But sometimes you have to allow yourself the time to go back and really appreciate those important things in your life. And I think that Final Fantasy is probably one of those things that I, I owe to myself to revisit. It's hard to talk at length about Final Fantasy VII without sparking a heated debate. Most people can agree that this game was a well-made, high-quality production, at least at launch. But somewhere between now and then, more and more people have jumped up the hype wave more than anything. This is attributed to the game's admittedly confusing story, but let's think about everything so far about Final Fantasy VII, right? It's a game about loss and identity, but not just for Cloud or any other characters in the game. Final Fantasy VII sets out to create a feeling of loss and confusion within yourself too. Most obviously, whether you enjoyed it or not, this can be seen when you lose Aerith or when Cloud is replaced by Tifa and Sid at the head of the party. But what if there's more than that to this game? What if Final Fantasy VII is the video game version of a modern novel, where the structure of the work itself is tied into the theme it's trying to get across? Maybe Final Fantasy VII obscures the truth and leaves a little bit more of the story to be unclear so you can interpret it for yourself. So at the end, when you have total hindsight of the whole experience, you can apply what you felt as you took the journey and give the whole thing some personal meaning. Now, when I picked up Final Fantasy VII, it was during a time where I lost my own mother to dementia when I was very young, and everything this game did at the time struck so well with me, it made so much more sense, and as a kid, I was just a child during the whole thing, and it stuck with me. This extended review has been that for me, and I hope all of you at home got something from it too. This was my journey, and while there was some similarities, it's never going to be the exact same for every single one of us. Gaia feels real, and none of us are going to see every last inch of it. And so, even though I am the completionist, I'm happy to know there's always more out there for me to think about and interpret and see in this game. And for the first time in a long while, I do not want to give this a completionist scale of burn it to complete it, because, you know what, it's up to you guys at home to make the informed decision about it. I hope you all enjoyed our journey so far, but we still have to think about Zack's journey and what the theme of embracing your dreams is truly about. I want to say a very special thank you to Jimmy, to Alex for helping me write this series, to Greg for being so patient and kind with the creation of this whole thing, and most importantly, all of our guests who've been on the show, Aaron, Jesse, Matt, and Sam, and obviously all you guys at home. So with that in mind, we'll see you guys next week for our in-depth analysis of Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII.